For Prima Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba, former journalist, lecturer, and researcher Mignon Breyer, discusses a book titled Bloody Sunday, The Nun, The Defiance Campaign, and South Africa's Secret Massacre. Your book follows the trail of a remarkable sister Aiden into the heart of a missing chapter in our country's past and what was one of the most devastating massacres of the apartheid era. Briefly tell us what led you to start researching the story which few people know about. Tabi, I, I first learned about the story in a, in a small way when I was probably still a child. My mother told me a story about a woman, a nun who had been burned to death in a township. Um, where she lived and she worked. It was a kind of cautionary tale. My parents had been mission educators, so they were, I think, you know, frightened of a, a similar situation. Um, but I, I didn't ask any questions about it until long after my mother died. And then uh, I happened to find out some details and I learned the name of the nun. And I realized that this was the woman that my mother had been talking about. And I became fascinated, you know, because the story was never told in full, as it were, it was always told half from one side or the other. And um, a lot of the information was buried. And I was just intrigued as to why the story had been covered up. And to be honest, I became a bit obsessed in trying to find out what exactly had happened and, and also wanting to tell it in such a way that the people knew the other side of the story um, as much as possible. And as you just mentioned that your mother always cautioned you about locations. So tell us about your reactions when you discovered the newspaper clips from her Bible about Sister Aiden and the riots. Yes, I think um, that was how I discovered that it was Sister Aiden Quinlan, who was the woman that my mother had told me about. I just found these clippings which said the one was just a picture of her and, and her name, and the other was a picture of a burnt out classroom. And it said, um, this is the devastation after the riots in Duncan Village in East London on the 9th of November, 1952. And that stage, that was all I saw. And I, I realized that my mother only knew half the story. Um, she didn't know what happened to the many other people who were killed by the police. It was interesting because my mother didn't want me to go into townships, but actually I went back and back into Duncan Village many, many times after that, trying to pursue um, the story and trying to find out what actually happened. And Sister Aiden, who is believed to have driven into the area to help the wounded, was stoned and burned to death in her car, and her body was also mutilated. Can you briefly tell us more about Sister Aiden? Um, yes, um, at the time of her death, she was 38 years old. Um, she was a medical doctor. She had trained to be a medical doctor at Bits, and she was a nun, and she was a member of a congregation which was based in King Williamstown originally a German congregation of nuns, but they had set up the head office in King Williamstown. She was actually from Ireland originally. She grew up in County Cork and in the city of Cork and um, became a nun after she'd done a Bachelor of Science degree at the university there, which is quite an un unusual thing for a woman of that era. So she was obviously very bright why she joined the convent, you know, her family are not quite sure because she was not really relig very religious. But I think the thing at that time, Tabi, was that there weren't many opportunities for women, especially in Ireland. It had been through very difficult times. The economy was very bad and many women had no option. They either got married or they became a spinster, which was a very difficult life for them, or they became a nun. And if you went into the missions, which meant going to another country, it was actually quite an exciting option for a, for a, a, a young woman. And then the other factor is that she had a, a, a relative who had, or someone thought to be a relative who had come out to Port Elizabeth and was a priest here. So she knew something of the environment and a, someone close to her was here. But then when she was here, they sent her to Witz where she studied medicine during the war years and interestingly studied at the same time as um, Nelson Mandela and also James and John Gwe, who was the leader of the ANC in the Port Elizabeth area. And he was to play a, an important role in her life eventually, not in a way that she knew about, but they, their paths uh, crossed eventually. 
And on November 9th, 1952 in, in East London, a religious meeting was broken up by a large group of police who were convinced that the meeting was not religious. So can you tell us more on what transpired on that bloody Sunday? Yes, um, it was an extremely violent day. What happened, I think I just need to, if you don't mind, just take you back a little bit. It was at the time of the Defiance campaign, which was a campaign that had been launched in June that year. It was planned at the, in December at a meeting of the ANC in December, but they launched it in June. And what was happening was that people were defying their laws that had been introduced by apartheid and some other more long-standing laws like the past laws. They were defying them by actually inviting arrests. So they would um, go into the whites only area of a, a railway station, for example, and invite the police to arrest them. So they were flooding the, the jails. And this had been going on for months and months. And it was a passive resistance campaign, very well organized, very nonviolent. But in about October, there were these incidents of um, violence that broke out. In my opinion, going into the history and the archives as much as I can, in almost every situation, the police provoked the people. There were three episodes in Port Elizabeth, in Johannesburg and in Kimberley, at the end of which about 20 people at least had been killed by the police and probably many, many more. And also four white people. And, and the police were now really trying to close in on the defiance campaign and bring it to an end. So on this weekend, where all the events happened when the nun was killed, the government had banned all political meetings throughout the Eastern Cape. But what happened is that they very strangely gave permission for a prayer meeting to happen in Duncan Village. A prayer meeting that, you know, it, it's very interesting that the police gave them that permission, despite the fact that the meetings were banned. And even more interesting is the fact that almost immediately after giving permission to the local leader of the ANC Youth League there, they um, banned all the leaders in this, ANC leaders in the area, including the ANC Youth League leaders. So that meeting went ahead without any leadership. So it was in that background that the police arrived in great force. They had brought in policemen from out of the, the city. There were 109 policemen, of whom half were black policemen, and the black policemen were in the manner of things at that time. They were given only batons to, to defend, to use, but the white policemen came with rifles, with .303 rifles and fixed bayonets, revolvers, and also Sten guns, which are military uh, submachine guns. So that is how they came to the meeting. And then when they decided that the meeting was not a prayer meeting, because they saw an ANC flag flying, they decided it wasn't a prayer meeting and that they were going to bring it to an end. So they dispersed the crowd, firstly with a baton charge. And when that didn't work, and the crowd started stoning the police, they then uh, opened fire. And in that First round, and it's just to emphasize there were two rounds of killings by the police that day. In that first round, they killed about eight people um, and injured about 27. And they later admitted to killing those. But then things happened after that uh, in which uh, there was a massacre. And the death toll for that day of the massacre was reported to be eight black people, as you just mentioned, and two white people were killed by the Duncan village residents. But today it is believed that between 80 and 200 people died. And that despite an inquest, many deaths were covered up. Can you briefly share with us some of the findings to this? Yes. So what happened after they had that first police action where they, as I said, killed about eight people and injured about 27, the police then withdrew. The crowd, as you can imagine, were enraged and uh, many of them were young people. They broke up into groups and they went through the township, basically attacking any symbols of white control. So they, they set a fire and looted buildings and, in, and then killed two white people. So the one was an insurance salesman called Byron Forster who had come to the area to collect his dues. 
he was a man who was quite well known in the township, but not to these people who came across him and, and killed him, I think, just because they were saw him as a white man. The other person who was killed was the sister Aidan Quinlan, this nun that I was telling you about. Well, well, from my research, I, I'm pretty sure that she went into this particular area where um, she came across a group of very angry youth. She came into this area, as far as I know, to look to the wounded or to help the wounded. As I said, she lived in Duncan Village, but in another part of the township. And she wouldn't normally have gone into that very busy part at the weekends because she knew there would be a lot of people. Many of the people would be drinking, socializing in the streets and so on. So she normally avoided that area. And I, I'm pretty sure that she went in because she heard people were wounded and she went to um, help them. What happened then was that the a crowd turned on her and killed her and, um, you know, stabbed her, hit her, burned, set her alight, and then subsequently, as I've said, mutilated her body quite dramatically. When the police found the bodies of the white people, they then went on a rampage themselves. So for about at least four hours, I mean, some people say the shooting went on all through the night, but from many sources, I can say that the shooting went on for at least four hours, the police going through the township with their machine guns and their revolvers and rifles and shooting into the shacks, around the shacks, between the shacks. It was a very, very densely populated area. The numbers, 80 to 200, the, the police gave no indication officially that they'd had done anything other than that in the first round of killing. So the numbers have come informally. If you speak to people in the township, they will tell you hundreds of people were killed. The first figure of 80 that I mentioned was the, the Eastern Province Herald on the very first report that they carried on of this um, event. They mentioned the figure 80. They said at least 80 were killed. The Daily Dispatch, which was had a much closer relationship with the police at the time, they said they didn't give a number. They just said it was considerable. Then the very next day, the Minister of Police arrives from Pretoria and suddenly we get an official figure and everybody is told to stick to that official figure, which is the eight. Actually, initially they gave the figure as seven and then they added one other person who must have died you know, in hospital. The figure of 200 comes from a, a police officer who, or a former police officer who at the time was the investigating officer in the Sister Aiden murder trial. And he was in the security police in subsequent years. Um, but at, the, at that particular time, he was an ordinary detective. He left the police force in about 1970. And after he leaving the police force, he has repeatedly claimed that more than 200 people were killed. He says that the police were instructed to investigate the white deaths primarily particularly Sister Aiden. East London was all out to find out who had um, killed her, particularly. But um, in the process, he said, they collected information about all the other people who were died. And he knew that their bodies had been taken out of the area and buried wherever people could find them. They were just buried informally. They could not take the their, their, their wounded or the their, their dead to the hospitals because they just got arrested if you presented yourself at a hospital or even came looking for a relative who was in hospital, you would immediately get charged with murder of the nun or being uh, suspected of being involved. So he has repeatedly over the years said that he knows specifically of 22 bodies that were taken to an area, what used to be called Berlin, Dongwe location it was called at that time, and also eight bodies that were transported across the Kai. And he said they kept this informal notebook and the number eventually came to 214. And now, you know, people have said, well, okay, he was a security policeman. Um, maybe he later appeared before the Truth Commission. Um, maybe he, um, you know, had reason for saying this and we shouldn't take his, his view seriously. But in my view, tracking back he first made these claims in the 70s when it wasn't in his interest to claim that the police were behaving in that way. He had changed his political alliances 
and become uh, what was then a PFP and a supporter of Donald Woods and so on. But it certainly wasn't in his interest to be talking about this. So I have put weight on his argument that there was over 200. And there are many other factors in my book that point to, you know, me showing how this was possible for various reasons. It was possible for massacre like that to happen without it being known. And lastly, was the relationship of the media and the police the results for very little information about what happened the afternoon of the 9th of November? Yes, there was a close relationship between the police and the Daily Dispatch newspaper in East London at the time. So that um, they, the Dispatch newspaper actually underreported the defiance campaign, didn't carry pictures about what was happening and carried only very small reports and virtually nothing uh, that gave the side or the argument of the protesters. When it came to this particular meeting that it, the uh, police told the Daily Dispatch journalists to keep out of Duncan Village. And as a result, they, they didn't go there and there was no press um, observing what happened. So that was the, the start as, as, and, the, and the press were kept out of the area for quite a while afterwards. And also the, the one African journalist who might have been able to report he was politically involved himself. He worked for Invo Samansundo, and he was politically involved and was not banned at the time. So he was also not there. There are various other factors that made it possible for things to happen in East London without the general public outside of Duncan Village actually knowing. The area was very uh, isolated. It, it was surrounded by buffer the territory open land and the police could cordon it off quite in, uh, clearly, quite easily. And they did that and they had complete, complete control over the township. And, the, and, you know, it was the other thing was that the procedure for registering deaths was changed. The laws were changed in June 1952. So although the East London municipality had very carefully kept records of deaths, all deaths, black deaths, even tiny babies who died in hospital. Their deaths were recorded by East London right up until June 1952. And then the government changed the rules and it was all centralized within this new Department of Bantu Affairs or then still Native Affairs. And once it did that, somehow the reporting stopped. We don't know whether they actually did register the deaths anywhere, but the fact was that all those deaths that I mentioned could happen without any written record because the government had changed the rules in this way. That was Mignon Breyer speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about Bloody Sunday.